In chapter 11, we look at angular momentum, but the first section actually talks about rolling motion, where friction is going to provide the torque that's going to cause the wheel to rotate. And one of the big questions that we have with these types of problems is, will the wheel actually slip, uh, meaning that will it be favorable for the, the wheel to actually rotate with the surface, where the uh, torque is enough to uh, provide um, the change in angular momentum to keep it rolling, or will the uh, moment of inertia be too great for the, uh, the friction that's applied, really exceed the torque that's needed to keep it going. So for a rolling wheel on a surface, we're interacting basically through two different forces. The first force is fairly obvious. This of course is the normal force. Whenever we push down on a surface, usually it's the weight of the object pushing down on the surface. The normal surface is going to act perpendicularly uh, to the, uh, the plane of the surface and push back up. The next force that will happen is friction. Obviously, if I create a torque to try to induce the wheel to roll, there is going to have to be some interaction between the, the wheel and the surface to create this rolling. So again, uh, the normal force, usually we don't really have to worry about this very much. We covered that already with the translational motion that essentially the normal force isn't completely taken out by the weight. It's not completely canceled out by the weight. So going down a hill, there will be a translational acceleration, a net force that, that wants to get the wheel going. However, the question becomes, is there enough friction to create a rolling motion? And really what we need to have happen is that the static friction has to be large enough to provide the torque to uh, cause the, the wheel to rotate. So we say that the static friction is less than or equal to uh, mu s, which is the static coefficient of friction, uh, times the normal force. So when we're looking at these types of objects, you know, again, looking at the different forces on the wheel, we have the normal force, we have the frictional force, we have weight acting on the wheel. And, you know, if there's some additional force that's causing it to roll, um, that will also uh, create uh, a net force. If a wheel rolls without slipping, then we can basically say that omega, the angular velocity, is equal to the velocity of the wheel, the center of mass, divided by the radius. This is something that we've done before. And alpha is equal to uh, basically the acceleration of the center of mass divided by the radius. This is a very similar problem to what we had with the, with the pulley. Essentially, the rope was moving with the rotation of the wheel. Here, instead of having tension creating a torque, we are creating a torque through the static friction between the wheel and the surface. And of course, when we're looking at every point on the surface right here, uh, the center of mass of the wheel is, what if we take the center of mass to be stationary, every point is moving in the opposite direction. If we take a point on here to be stationary, then of course it is the wheel which is actually in motion. So let's take a look at this. Here we have a wheel rolling down this inclined plane. We've done this before. We have the uh, X component of the weight equaling mg sine theta. This is essentially what is going to uh, create the acceleration uh, downhill. And then we have fg mg, I'm sorry, the Y component of the weight equaling mg cosine theta. So, um, and looking at the, the weight here, again, um, the translational acceleration, if there are no other forces acting on this, is going to be related to the X component of the weight. Again, taking that the X direction is downhill and the Y component is going to contribute to the normal force here uh, because it's gonna be equal and opposite to the Y component of the weight. So again, we'll do translational uh, motion first, the sum of the forces in the x direction equal to mg sine theta, okay? Minus uh, the frictional force that's going to be equal to 
uh, Ma. And of course, we have Mg cosine theta minus the normal force is going to be equal to zero here. And that again is just showing that N is equal to Mg cosine theta. And then N is going to be placed up here where mu, okay, times N is equal to Fs, where that's the maximum value that it can have. We can say that um, in some cases, we don't need all of that force there, but it's going to be less than or equal to mu S times N. Okay, so um, once again, we're just looking at the general acceleration here. We see that uh, again, accelerating the X direction. Normally, if I'm just sliding down the hill, my acceleration would be equal to G sine theta, and it would be fairly simple. But now, if we cause the uh, wheel to rotate, it is interacting with the surface through this Fs, the static friction, and we have to take that into account in terms of how that affects the mass. But again, um, this is a little bit tricky because we need to now connect this to the rotational inertia of the wheel itself. All right, let's now apply uh, Newton's second law for rotation of bodies. We're gonna say that sum of the torques is equal to I alpha. Here's where we can connect that frictional force back to the rotational motion. We only have one rotational force on this. We only have one torque acting on this, and that's the frictional force. So this wheel is going to want to rotate this way as a surface pushes on this point uphill. So the wheel goes downhill. The surface is pushed uphill. That creates our torque. That torque is equal to the radius times the uh, force due to friction, force due to static friction. And essentially, that is my torque equals I alpha. So this is now related to this. So our static friction is going to be equal to, if it's rolling, the moment of inertia times acceleration divided by R squared. Again, I'm going to replace our former equation right here. Remember. This is where we ended up with the acceleration before. I'm going to replace this with IA uh, over MR squared. And now we get a new expression for accelerations, you know, solving for A, that the acceleration is equal to G sine theta over one plus I um, MR squared. Now, this only works for the case where the wheel is rotating with the surface. If it's sliding, then this term goes away. We just get G sine theta. If we have the case somewhere in between where it's rolling, but it's also sliding, that's really very, very difficult to analyze in this particular case. But um, the question now becomes, all right, how much friction do I need in order to um, get this to roll versus if it's going to slide while it's going downhill. All right. So um, here again is our acceleration. We know that Fs must be less than or equal to mu s, that's the coefficient of friction between the, the wheel and the surface, times mg cosine theta. So what I want to do here is I want to make a substitution, okay? I know that m g sine theta minus a, okay, is basically going to be equal to my my frictional force if I can if I can maintain this this rotation. That must be less than or equal to mu s m g cosine theta, which is the maximum amount of frictional force that I can get. Okay, so here's the frictional force that I have. Here's the maximum that I can get. I must be less or equal to that. So now I'm going to solve for mu s with this inequality, okay? We get that mu s must be greater than or equal to uh, sine theta minus ag over cosine theta. So looking at this equation right here, we can see that as the angle becomes greater and greater, as this becomes larger and larger, our value for mu s is going to be greater and greater. Also, cosine theta, 
as the angle gets greater and greater, it becomes less and less. Okay, so um, plugging in for a solid wheel, okay? We're gonna plug in uh, for, for our solid wheel. We're gonna now say that, all right, um, here we have our acceleration from our previous result. I'm gonna plug that into my equation for the coefficient of friction, okay? Now I get that mu s is greater than or equal to this rather large uh, expression right here. But I can simplify this by saying sine divided by cosine is just tangent. So I've sine divided by cosine, that's tangent times one minus sine divided by cosine over one plus i m r squared. And now we've simplified down to this equation right here. Okay. If it's a solid wheel, I can further make a substitution and say that I is equal to one half MR squared, okay? So for our solid wheel, plug in for I, solid wheel, MR squared divided by MR squared cancels out. We have one plus one half, okay? So basically one plus one half is going to be one third. And um, one minus one third becomes two thirds. Here's our equation for what our static coefficient of friction must be in order for this wheel to keep rolling. Now, if the coefficient of friction is less than this, then what's going to happen is we are going to start sliding. We're going to, you know, probably be, you know, not, you know, straight sliding because there will be some transfer of um, of, uh, of of rotational, there'll be some torque here. There'll be some transfer uh, uh, to the wheel where some of the kinetic energy will end up as, as rotational kinetic energy. Um, but again, that's really difficult to uh, analyze because now you're in the kinetic coefficient um, of friction range. We just wanna see if we can go down this wheel, go down this hill, and have the wheels uh, rotate, re maintain traction with this. So um, we can do the same for a hollow cylinder. If we have our expression for a, a solid cylinder, we get this right here, tangent theta times two thirds. If instead I put it for a hollow cylinder, where we know I is mR squared, we get one minus one half, we can see that this, it's actually easier to uh, keep rolling with the surface if we have a higher moment of inertia, the hollow cylinder has a higher moment of inertia than if I have a solid um, disc right here. So um, in looking at this and analyzing this for different conditions, uh, for most slopes under uh, 30 degrees, we usually have enough friction to keep the wheel rotating, there you only uh, really need a coefficient of friction for 15 degrees of 0.179 for a solid cylinder, 0.134 for a hollow cylinder at 30 degrees. Uh, we're getting a little bit more. Obviously, if this hill were icy, we would not be able to maintain um, you know, traction here. And as we get to a 45 degree angle, um, we really, you know, start getting, needing a fairly high static coefficient of friction. And certainly at 60 degrees, you're not going to really hope to, uh, you know, keep rolling with the surface. Um, with a solid cylinder, with a hollow cylinder, you really need a, a pretty adhesive surface. And at 75 degrees, as we'd expect, it's going to probably slide most of the way down. So again, this is um, not exactly directly connected with angular momentum, which is really the topic here. But it, it shows how friction can uh, create a torque on the wheel and either provide enough torque to overcome what is what is needed in terms of the, the moment of inertia to keep it ro rotating. Or in the case where the friction is not enough, we can see if we're going to slide down the hill.